Turning to this theme of uh, integrated transport and economic regeneration, I don't know about you, but I've actually been fascinated by how the language has actually changed uh, over a period of time. In the, at the depths of the recession, we were seeing that schemes were stopped, uh, or indeed there was a lot of doubt over them. And then as we've moved through, the language has moved to transport being seen as a real engine for growth. Uh, and that really has been, I think, quite a remarkable transition uh, over a period of time. And the other thing I would just say is that in terms of the general mood in, in the general public out there, um, yes, we hear about protests, but really they do want very good transport full stop. It's not actually uh, a road versus rail argument. They want both, uh, and they want better uh, in order to help them with their lives and go about their business. And just returning perhaps to the theme on the LEPs, if one looks at what are the key priorities coming through there, then it's also very clear that it's transport and it's people and training are the two key issues that have really come through. Uh, and I think that really is key for our future prosperity. So, to today, um, we're going to try and answer some fundamental questions, I think, about the future development uh, of UK. So, how we develop those transport links, how that ties in with growth, and importantly, I think, how one does it in a sustainable way. So I think there's, there's some key issues in there for us. So I certainly hope we're going to build on that keynote speech from, from Lord Dighton. Um, we're also going to draw on some key work that's taken place, I know, with NHS2, looking at the benefit of regions, benefit to the regions from uh, transport investment. And then, importantly, picking up the integration theme, how each of the uh, individual modes is responding, I think, to those social and technical challenges. So, great uh, session in prospect, I think. We've got four excellent speakers to, uh, to stimulate the debate. Uh, and so I'd really like now, uh, without further ado, to invite Alison Munro, Chief Executive of HS2 Limited, uh, to join us. Thank you very much. I think I've got six minutes just to outline um, a few points on High Speed 2. So what I was just going to say a bit about the, the opportunities that High Speed 2 offers and some of the challenges that we face um, in delivering those. So perhaps first of all, picking up uh, Lord Dighton, seeing about the two key things that you need to, in terms of the case for infrastructure, the right infrastructure and jobs and growth. The right infrastructure, so High Speed 2 is providing the essential long-term capacity that we need on the railways, joining up our major cities. I think that, that case is now, I think, pretty well made. Um, we've also pretty clear of the opportunities that we can deliver in terms of, of jobs and growth. So the core cities have estimated that uh, there's the opportunity for 400,000 jobs around the city stations on High Speed 2. Um, Network Rail has done some work suggesting that there are 100 towns and cities that can benefit not just from High Speed 2 itself, but when you look at the capacity that High Speed 2 releases on the existing network, all the other towns and cities that can benefit from, from better services. Um, during construction and the operation of the line, there were massive job opportunities there, peaking at about 50,000 in the late 2020s uh, when we're building the railway but also operating the first phase of the railway. And also opportunities in terms of really a long-term legacy in terms of the skills that we can create because with High Speed 2, we've got a sort of 20-year pipeline of, of work on High Speed 2. We can offer a career in High Speed 2 and we've got the opportunity to build the skills that will be there for businesses to go and compete worldwide in the future. So there's a, a fantastic opportunity there, I think, with, with High Speed 2 in terms of you know, the benefits that we can deliver. Um, so perhaps just briefly turning to some of the challenges that we face in delivering those. Um, we've touched a bit, and, and Lord Dighton mentioned the, the, the political risk, which um, is certainly with a long-term project like High Speed 2 is obviously a, a factor. We need successive governments to support High Speed 2. Um, but I think really we're in the best possible place that we can be on that, having had a very successful um, second reading debate with our hybrid bill currently in Parliament, where we had a... a one of the largest majorities that this government has had in favour of High Speed 2 and all, all the main parties supporting it. So I think, you know, obviously that, I'm not saying that's not a risk for the future, but I think we're in the best possible place we can be in terms of cross-party support. We obviously have got some um, risks around the, the planning regime. We are now in the hybrid, hybrid bill process. We're waiting to see at the end of this week how many petitions we'll have against the bill, and obviously that will determine the length of the planning process. So it's actually quite difficult to plan precisely um, for the length of, uh, of how long that planning planning process will be, but um, I think we're, we're pretty sort of well prepared for that. We've obviously got challenges continuing to, uh, to deliver on 
on, on budget and on time, um, and that's a continuing focus. But really what I wanted to focus on is, is the challenge of actually delivering all of those benefits, because that's what will really you know, make the case for High Speed 2. It's a massive investment, and we really need to make sure that the country gets the most out of it. Um, and both um, Lord Dighton's report, the Growth Task Force report, and also David Higgins' report in, in March have both really sort of focused on the key things that we need to do to, do to, to maximise the benefits of High Speed 2. And those, those fall into four um, areas. What, the first one is about making sure that the cities uh, that we serve get the maximum benefit. So there we're working very closely with the cities. Um, they are responsible, obviously, for producing master plans and really sort of anticipating getting ready for high speed two, making sure that their local plans are really being developed to maximise uh, the, the opportunities. And we've seen, for example, in Birmingham, they produce a Curson Street master plan, a very ambitious plan for how they can really regenerate the whole sort of eastern sector of the city off the back of high speed too. So we're working very closely with the cities to make sure that they're getting all of those plans in place. We're also picking up one of the recommendations from uh, Lord Dighton's report, which is to establish a central uh, regeneration company, a government-backed regeneration company, which can work with the cities to help them um, maximise those opportunities. There's also the integration challenge, again, which was picked up both by uh, the David Higgins report and, and Lord Dighton's report both in terms of local connectivity, as already mentioned, but we need to make sure that to maximise the benefits, the High Speed 2 network is very well connected into local transport networks so that the benefits can be spread um, out through the city regions and that as many people as possible can use High Speed 2. So again, we're working very closely with the cities. Um, the funding for that will come from other sources, but, but we're working very closely to make sure we have integrated plans so that our station designs fit in with their um, local aspirations and that we're making sure that all works together as effectively as possible. And then also integrating with the National Rail Network, so working very closely with Network Rail, um, for, because High Speed 2 and the release capacity it creates provides really an opportunity to recast the whole of the rail network when we've got High Speed 2 in, in place. So working closely with Network Rail and, and they'll be starting a process to engage more widely on that. So how do we really make sure that that opportunity to look at the whole of the transport network, not just High Speed 2 in in isolation can be used to maximise the benefits. Um, and also so that future infrastructure investment by network rail complements what we're doing on high speed too. I think the third um, area I just wanted to mention is skills, which uh, I think you, you, you've, you've mentioned. Um, but there is an enormous challenge for us in terms of actually having the skills in this country to deliver high speed two on top of everything else that is coming up. We have a, a massive um, pipeline, not just with high speed two, but, but with Thames Tideway, with all, all the um, highways agency schemes. We already, even without high speed two, don't have enough um, graduates in, in STEM subjects, um, say even at the moment. So there's a massive challenge for us to make sure that the, the, our workforce is actually ready and capable to make the most of the opportunities that, that we can deliver. So we're, we're doing a lot um, within High Speed 2, uh, both in terms of trying to stimulate interest um, in, in young people to actually enter STEM subjects. In some areas, particularly women and, and, and ethnic minorities, are very un, enormously underrepresented in, in STEM subjects. So we're, we've got uh, now about 40 ambas educational ambassadors in High Speed 2 who are going out into schools and trying to generate interest in, in those subjects. And we're also working on uh, identifying pathways so that then that once that interest is stimulated, people can see a career path um, in, into, into those subjects. And you've also probably picked up that business announced a, a new high-speed rail college. We're currently um, receiving bids for where the location of that college will be. So again, to sort of make sure that we are really developing the skills to make the most of those opportunities. And just finally, um, the, other, the final area I just wanted to mention is getting our businesses ready. Again, it's, it's partly about getting the skills, but it's also partly making sure that businesses, all of you, actually understand enough about what we're doing. So we're really setting out as clearly as we can how we see our future procurements happening, uh, the timing of those, the scale of those, so that business can be getting itself ready and preparing so that it can compete um, and hopefully win as much of business um, in the UK for the work that we will be offering. So we had a, a supply chain conference last autumn. We'll be holding another one this year. We had uh, 800 people come along to the conference last year. So we're really trying to say, trying to make sure that business can get itself ready as well. And, and, and also really making sure that all the tiers, so we're making sure also that uh, we can maximise the opportunities for SMEs as well as the, um, the first tier. So I say a big agenda there in, in those four areas, I think, which is really what I think 
to, to really pick up the theme of how we really make sure that infrastructure fully supports both regeneration and jobs and growth. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Alison. As you say, a very big agenda. We'll move swiftly on to uh, our next contributor, which is uh, Darren Kaplan, who's the Chief Executive of the Airport Operators Association. Uh, Darren will join us from here, and I think it's fairly clear what he'll be talking about. Thanks for that. Good morning. Thanks for having me here today. Yep, Darren Kaplan, Chief Executive of the Airport Operators Association. We're a trade association for UK airports. We represent large international hub airports down to the smallest aerodromes, and we campaign tirelessly for both vibrant point-to-point -point airports and sufficient world-class hub capacity. And a lot of my talks will be about how we deliver growth for our sector and how that fits in with the agenda uh, today. Now, uh, from a, an AOA perspective, we want to see the sky is filled with planes. We want people flying all over the place because that means the economy is doing well. That means trade's taking place. Business deals are happening. People are going on holidays, which means tourism's uh, benefiting the UK economy. People are visiting friends and family. There's nothing negative to us about people flying uh, around the world, flying domestically. And we think uh, aviation is important in its own right, but it's also important to the wider economy. So in itself, it supports about a million jobs, provides about 50 billion pound GDP, 8 billion pound in uh, tax revenue for the treasury. Uh, so it's a major contributor, but it also enables uh, exports, it enables manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, uh, and tourism. I mean, tourism itself employs about two and a half million people. Uh, it's about 200 billion plus in GDP as well. So if aviation is doing well and other sectors are doing well, it benefits the wider economy. It's not just about us uh, doing well in our, in our own sector. So we have kind of what we call the, the two ask, the two gives strategy in order to grow. Obviously, we want to grow for our members, we want to grow for UK PLC. Um, our two key asks are, first of all, we want a fair framework for growth. Now, you'll know our sector's been in the news quite a lot recently. In a positive way, uh, and this backs up what some contributors are saying, and what Lord Dighton was saying, um, four years ago, we had a terrible situation in terms of our policy uh, uh, governance. We had a policy called better, not bigger. So airports weren't allowed to grow, but we were supposed to become better. But the situation has changed massively in the last few years. So last year we had an aviation policy framework that came out that was very positive towards our sector, enabled us to grow, uh, basically said that we could, provided we deliver on carbon, noise, impacts around airports, we could grow as a sector. And so we're very grateful the government has moved on that. We also have the Airports Commission, which we'll all, all know about, and Sir Howard Davis has been mentioned already today. Um, we believe at the AOA we need more runway capacity. We haven't got enough. The um, DFT's own figures show that passenger number is going to grow by roughly double to 2050, and we haven't got the capacity where we need it. Uh, airports in the southeast be full up by 2030. Major airports outside the southeast be full up by 2040. We need to do something about it. We support the Airports Commission. We call on all the political parties to back that commission. Everyone should get behind it. And when the government reports in 2015, let's have some movement on the Airports Commission. So whether the answer is Heathrow, whether it's Gatwick, whether it's Thames uh, Estuary, we don't have a view about who should be winning that race, but we do need more capacity and we'll be backing that and pushing that very strongly. So that's one ask is we want a fair framework for growth for all airports. The second ask is uh, we want a fair level of tax. Now, it affects other sectors as well, whether it's road rail. Tax is a big issue as well, how it affects our sector. Uh, in aviation, we uniquely have the highest tax in our sector in the world. Air passenger duty is massively high. It's more than double any other country in the EU. And we campaigned very hard to get uh, cuts on air passenger duty. There was a cut in the budget last March on long-haul flights uh, beyond 4,000 miles. Now, all flights uh, are taxed up to what's called bands A and B. But having high AP APD doesn't just affect us in terms of our passenger numbers, and passenger numbers generally in the UK are going in the right direction, but it affects our connectivity. So it means that airlines, probably the most mobile trade you can think of, they can fly anywhere in the world, they decide to fly less regularly to the UK, or they don't fly at all, specifically because of air passenger duty. And we've had a number of airlines citing this as a reason not to fly uh, to the UK. So, for example, United, who are formerly Continental Airlines, have said uh, quite publicly they pulled out of their routes to Bristol and they pulled out of their routes to Liverpool because of high APD. AirAsia X have pulled out of routes from Manchester and from Gatwick. So, and, and there's a whole range. There's domestic airlines, there's Flybe, there's uh, Virgin, BA. APD is a major constraint on growth and it affects our connectivity. So our two key asks, let's have a fair framework for growth, let's have a uh, fair aviation, aviation tax. So what can we give in return? Well, you, I think you mentioned today about sustainability. Sustainable aviation is a key thing for our sector. Um, AOA and airports are part of a coalition called Sustainable Aviation. We work with airlines, aircraft and engine manufacturers, air traffic service providers, 
and we work to demonstrate how we can grow as a sector without increasing carbon and noise. So we can uh, grow to, uh, well, to 2050, we can increase our air traffic movements by about 90%, and through better operational measures, through new, uh, uh, better uh, newer aircraft, through uh, sustainable fuels, a whole range of measures, through not building uh, homes near airports, we can actually grow without increasing carbon and noise. We work very hard on sustainable aviation, we work with the government on that. But another one of our uh, key gives is developing a better passenger experience. And again, this is something that I sh I'll share with the panelists uh, in terms of their sector as, as well. We want to improve what we do for passengers, uh, whether it's enhancing security for outbound passengers, working with the government on that, improving the welcome uh, at borders for inbound passengers, but things like investing in terminals and runways and surface access. How do you get to the airport? And we work very closely on trying to have better surface access, integrating what we do with other forms of transport. So the AOA totally backs HS2. We want to be uh, working closer. HS2 benefits. Some people, some people are surprised that airports back HS2 because they think there's a substitution effect. There's not much of a substitution effect. Most people who have a choice will take rail if they can. They fly when they can't take rail or, or the price is much better. So we're more than happy for HS2 to be doing well. We want to be linking to the rail network, linking to the road network. Um, we have two real kiosks. One is we want the DFT to be looking at gaps in the system where we have bad surface access to airports. How can we improve that? And we want to work with Network Rail and Highways Agency and the DFT to deliver the, fund the priority projects that will benefit the network, the, the, the airport network in the future. So there's a few of the issues we're covering. It's quite, very clear we need a fair framework for growth. We need fair levels of aviation tax. We want to give sustainable aviation a better passion experience. If the government gets behind us, if it gets behind HS2, if it gets behind rail, if it gets behind shipping, the whole range of transport infrastructure, then we all benefit and the economy benefits too. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Darren. There's some, again, some major issues in there, not least uh, taxation and competition. I'm not sure whether Don da or John Darry later on will want to pick up the challenge of the, uh, of the gaps in the network. Perhaps that might be um, a, a discussion point. Um, but I'd now like to ask Andrew Bogey, who's Country and Business Director with Systra, to join us, please. Uh, and I think Andrew's theme is going to be uh, around industry contribution uh, and investment. Thank you very much indeed, uh um, I'd like to uh, firstly start off, if I may, uh, by echoing presumably many of the sentiments of, of those of you here um, to congratulate the HS2 task force on the recent work that they've done. They've produced a document called um, High Speed 2 Get Ready, which has been supported uh, largely by a series of detailed analyses by Atkins as well. And uh, I can strongly recommend that as, uh, as good reading to to, to bridge the gap, if you like, between the, what we hear at uh, national level about uh, the, the importance of investment and th what can be done at a practical level in order to ensure that that sort of uh, investment is realised. So uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, very, very briefly, really, is, um, is three themes. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about high-speed rail in general, not high-speed 2 specifically, but high-speed rail in general. Uh, I'm going to say a few things about France, as you might expect uh, as somebody representing a, a French company. And I'm going to say a few things about what uh, we in the AC might, might do and our reaction, if you like, to, um, uh, to this opportunity. First of all, um, I'll say that um, uh, it's clear that in the UK um, there's a huge amount that can be done in terms of ensuring that uh, our economy responds to this transport investment, that's, uh, this fabulous project in particular that's High Speed 2, uh, really, really begs a response from, from us in, in the industry and from uh, us in uh, engineering and consulting, uh, what are we going to do to respond? So um, we know that High Speed 2 is going to bring benefits in terms of uh, faster journey times to Birmingham and the north of England and Scotland eventually. And we know that that's going to attract passengers. And we know that that's a great thing in the sense that it's going to bring people um, closer together. It's going to help address the uh, evident north-south divide that we have in the UK. Um, we also know that that's going to have a significant impact on congestion relief on roads and on existing railway lines. That's, I think, a matter of fact. Um, and, of course, uh, passengers who are going to be carrying it on those, on those routes, the existing routes, um, will also benefit in terms of their, their local uh, connectivity and so on. Um, but we also know that there are important economic benefits associated with this sort of investment, and um, we know that those are analysed in terms of you know, benefit-cost ratios, and CISRA is doing some work for High Speed 2 on that aspect, which is all very interesting and uh, are very analytical, and not really for me as an engineer to comment upon. But um, uh, what we also know is that this only really comes together effectively if the planning is right, the strategy is right, 
and corporations in large and small, including, of course, many ACE members, feel that it's right to make those decisions at sort of local level, which are really about employment of people, about placing contracts and subcontracts, and about really making that work uh, on a practical level, those thousands of little commitments and connections that are necessary in order to ensure that the economy really, really works. And I have to applaud, uh, to be frank, uh, not just being purely sycophantic, uh, applaud what HS2 Limited is doing in terms of, uh, of, of ensuring that their analysis is, uh, is a balanced approach to procurement. Uh, they've done some consultation recently, which the ACE has supported in relation to uh, the way in which they're engaging with the market. And uh, we applaud the fact that that produces, in effect, what they call a balanced scorecard of analysis of, of the way in which different firms are contributing to uh, um, to, to high-speed rail and what they're doing to, to address this same issue of investment. So I want to turn now to a, to a couple of um, examples from France because we all know that France is, is almost uh, um, well, well reputed in Europe, should we say, for the close relationship between government and industry and uh, that's something that they have a strong reputation for. Um, I'll take a few examples, sort of small to, to, to the larger example, if I may. Um, first of all, in France, there's a, ever since 1982 when uh, the... Uh, first high-speed rail line open from Paris to, uh, to Lyon. Uh, there's been a law in France which requires um, the, the promoter to sponsor the production of a, um, of a, re a, review, a review document which in effect says how well have we done and um, what impact, uh, what socio-economic impact in particular have we had as a consequence of the investment that we've made. Very interesting. These are available on the internet. Um, so, uh, delving into those a little bit, we, we know um, in the UK quite a lot about Lille. Lille's just over the other side of, uh, of, of the channel, of course, and Lille is a classic example of where a high-speed line, in fact, the TGV Nord, the LGV Nord, has been built towards the channel tunnel, and that's seen as a classic example where they've been able to regenerate the city. In fact, historically, Lille has been a, very much an industrial uh, heart of, uh, of Paris. It's been an industrial economy, and the arrival of the high-speed line there has enabled some significant degree of transformation towards what is, in effect, a service economy, people going from Lille to Paris, Lille into the UK, working in London and so on, and that has made some sort of transformatory effect. There's also a local impact there in Lille itself. I'm sure many of you have been there, and you'll see that, uh, in effect, they've built Lille station, the new station, and then there's the old station, and they're busy filling in the gap between the two with all sorts of interesting architecture and, uh, um, and regenerative initiatives. So, so that's an interesting example and one which is well known. On a slightly more regional scale, um, the rural regions of France have historically suffered from... Um, uh, reduction in uh, employment opportunity, the transfer from farming and agriculture-based industry, um, and high unemployment as a consequence of, of, of uh, fewer jobs, especially for young people in, uh, in, those, um, uh, in that sector. So high-speed rail in France, and, and I've been looking at uh, the line from Paris to, Paris to, to Tours, has, has had a significant impact in terms of bringing opportunity for young people in particular, being able to get them into, Fra into Paris, and uh, improving their job opportunities and their connectivity. Um, the, the impact on that is, um, is slow, but it's nevertheless evident that the high-speed lines in France are having an impact on, in effect, rebalancing the economy away from agriculture and towards a service economy, which is really interesting to see. And one has to bear in mind that in, in, in France there are about 2,000 kilometres of new high-speed lines which have been built but there are about 7,000 kilometres of services which are provided using TGV trains. So, for example, you can go from Paris to, to Bordeaux today and you'll go as far as Tours on a new high-speed line and then you'll run on existing line. And there's a plan, of course, which is South Europe Atlantic to extend from uh, Tours down to Bordeaux, extending that infrastructure, which in effect creates the same enfranchising effect south of Bordeaux and gives connectivity also to Spain. So it, it's high-speed rail in France has been really uh, part of this sort of engine for, for economic growth and for uh, rebalancing of the economy in France. In fact, the French have invented a word. It's called technipole. And a technipole is um, uh, a little area, a zone around a high-speed rail station, often an out-of-town high-speed rail station, which um, is specifically like a kind of commercial zone. But, of course, they couldn't call it a commercial zone because that would be sort of a bit too, too English. So they've invented their own word, technipole. And... Um, that's had some effect. If you go to Le Mans, for any reason whatsoever, if you go to Le Mans, you'll see that there's a technipole there which is reputedly very successful and which gives um, opportunity for people to, uh, if you like, 
coalesce, if I can use that word, around the high-speed rail station that's been built there. So another interesting point is that the local authorities in France have made a growing contribution to high-speed rail. When high-speed rail first uh, kicked off back in 82, and indeed even for TGV Nord up to the Channel Tunnel, the local authorities hardly made any contribution at all. But now, um, if you take the, the brittany Loire line, um, that uh, has about a 40% contribution from local authorities, which to me is a very interesting marker of the fact that um, local authorities, local people are very supportive of the transformatory effect that high-speed rail can bring. And, and just to kind of conclude on that, really, the, I mean, the, it's, it's pretty obvious, but I'm stating nonetheless that the, the whole, it, whole initiative of, of high-speed rail in France has become you know, almost emblematic of, of what France can contribute around the world. And uh, I hesitate, of course, to overstate this, but um, uh, th there is, it is a, nonetheless clearly the case that... Um, this sort of investment, this sort of major national investment, not only in construction of rail lines, but also construction of trains and in engineering and in research and so on, um, is really part of a very clear joined up initiative that France has, something which is about investment in engineering, investment in skills, and um, that's been a significant success story over the last, uh, the last decades. So that to me is really all about this linkage between industrial policy and, and national investment policy, which I think is, is kind of what this, this, this um, opportunity uh, is all about. Uh, so I'm just going to close with a few other po points about the ACE, really, and what we can do. Um, members of the ACE, I, maybe I'm presuming too much about your support for high-speed rail. I hope not. But um, uh, in consulting and engineering, there, there are, I think there are four things that I, that I identify we should really be emphasizing. I think that... Um, uh, we should be supportive of the initiatives about investment in transport, High Speed 2 in particular. We should be working in collaboration with government and, uh, uh, and High Speed 2 in order to ensure that um, we present logical arguments, well thought through arguments in order to, to support their initiatives and that we um, also uh, work in collaboration with them. We should be working to value engineer good solutions, good engineering solutions for High Speed 2, making sure that uh, costs are brought down, and making sure that there's good value and good justification for the engineering choices that are made. Uh, we should be working um, to configure a supply chain relationship which is mature, uh, which promotes uh, investment in British skills, which is building on the good relationships in terms of alliancing and partnership that we in the industry have seen for the last uh, 20 years or so, certainly with Channel Tunnel Rail Link and with Crossrail. And we should be making as much effort as we can in terms of training and education because um, there really needs to be a significant increase in the, uh, the, the contribution, I think, that the private sector is making in terms of the um, opportunities for uh, STEM graduates and uh, those in schools who are taking an interest in, in those sorts of subjects. And I really applaud the work that Engineering UK is, done, is doing. The, the Big Bang initiative for them is, is really a, a must attend. And, and there are, it's, it's the, I understand it's the largest event for young people in the UK, which will attract 100,000 people to um, significant uh, fair to talk about engineering, research, and opportunities in technology, which is very much to be applauded. So um, young people really need to be looking at, uh, at engineering and, uh, um, and, and our environment um, as a way forward. I'm not wishing to uh, belittle the opportunities in the city, but really the world is there for, for, for them in, in our business, and I, I, um, I hope we can all make a, a contribution to that. So, thank you. So, to our final speaker, John Dowie, who's Director of Strategic Roads and Smart Ticketing at the Department for Transport, uh, and I think John's going to major on roads reform. Yes, that's right, David. Thank you. Um, just start, before I begin um, my remarks, just by going back to the earlier question um, when Paul Dighton was still with us about political hiatus. Um, I think it was Nick Pollard asked it. Um, I think my response is you should be telling. Nick should be telling. You should all be telling politicians that this is a real issue, this is a problem that they can address. I'm inhibited in what I can say. Um, I have to find out what the next, who the next government is, but you can be telling them all now, so I think that's your job. Right, what I was going on to say, um, about 10, 11 months ago, uh, we did our, um, the government produced a kind of seminal announcement in terms of strategic roads, uh, the motorways and trunk roads um, of England. 
That was partly a very big increase in the resources provided for the trunk road system, a tripling of investment by 2021. But it was also linked, chained to that, was a commitment on reform, on a better way of delivering, which would be partly through turning the Highways Agency into a company at arm's length from government, um, partly through putting a five-year investment programme on a statutory footing to create more certainty. That was a really big moment. Um, I'm going to start by just telling you where we stand today, 10 to 11 months later. And then I will just touch on three of the main criticisms, issues, that have been um, kind of thrown at us over the last, last few months. First of all, progress. Uh, some of you will be aware we published our response to the consultation on turning the highways agency into a company. Um, that was back in April. That took most of the decisions we needed to take um, in terms of how we were going to do that, in terms of putting in place more effective scrutiny on efficiency through a new roads, dedicated roads function within the kind of Office of Rail Regulation family, and also a stronger voice for the road user, again through a dedicated unit within Passenger Focus to increase the transparency and challenge. It's effectively the quid pro quo for greater arm's length from government. We also took the key decisions, confirmed key decisions about how we will set the company up, how it will operate by a license. The next step is, um, and of course I, when I was young, you could end up in the Tower of London for this, um, but we might, we might just possibly have legislation. We'll have to see what the, key, the Queen's speech says on the 4th of June. Um, but let's, let's assume for the sake of argument we do. Um, I then um, hope that if it's in there, we should be ready to table a bill in Parliament within days of the Queen's speech. Um, of course, um, that's hypothesis. <laughs> that will then put on paper our commitments in terms of both turning the highways agency into a company, but also crucially, and I know it's the thing you're all focused on, um, putting our forward investment program on a statutory footing. So you can look out for that, see what happens in um, two and a half weeks time, not that I'm counting. Um, we've um, also pub gone out to consultation on a new national policy statement for road and rail. Uh, that consultation is closed. That's creating a planning framework, um, a ministerial policy that will guide subsequent planning decisions. That's been out to consultation. We're hard at work absorbing all of that, taking account of the views of various uh, parties with a view to submitting, tabling our final version in Parliament in the, the autumn after the summer. So we're making progress on that. We're also, though less visibly to the outside world, um, we are making progress in terms of developing the first road investment strategy, which we are targeting for the autumn of this year. That's the strategy that will then be uh, linked to the legislation. So, real progress. I'm feeling, as far as I could be in the in current circumstances with all the challenges, broadly comfortable. Um, in terms of some of the things that have been... Uh, raise some of the criticisms that have been thrown in our, in our way. One was the, the Transport Select Committee report um, in the last, I think it was the last two, three weeks. They questioned whether highways agency corporatization made sense, whether that was actually necessary. Can't you do everything you're proposing to do, government, just by leaving it as part of the, the Department for Transport? Um, the government proposes to, well, will publish its formal response in June, but I'll give you a little insight. Uh, the answer is no. It won't do what we are um, trying to achieve because actually what we're trying to decisively break away from is the ambiguity of having um, a delivery agency, a key part of our infrastructure delivery, stuck in the middle of a government department. Uh, would anyone th in the room think that was a sensible thing to do with our water industry? Let's just give it back to 
DEFRA, let's locate it in Whitehall. It does not make sense. We need a much more arm's length relationship, a contractual relationship, clear uh, mutual obligations and duties, and then, as I touched on earlier, effective enforcement of that, effective monitoring to, sh to see that the outputs are delivered. So, in our view, that's absolutely essential part of the reform. Second thing that has been raised by some, um, and I definitely want to scotch, is the suggestion this is, um, this is this government's strategy. This government's policy won't be suitable for another government um, here today, gone tomorrow. Comes back to the hiatus question of, of earlier. Um, again, that's absolutely not how we see this. Um, this is a better way of delivering, a better mechanism. That's what we're putting in place. It is not a, um, it does not mandate a particular roads program, a particular scale of roads program, a particular balance of road program. It is about ensuring greater continuity of funding, greater specificity of funding, um, a better delivery structure. Um, I'm being very clear at every opportunity I, um, I can to, to make clear that every parliament, every government will have its opportunity to introduce its own roads investment strategy, just as currently happens with rail on a broadly five-year cycle. Um, if a particular government felt that the road investment strategy it had inherited from the previous government was really not acceptable, it could reopen it as long as it went through the process and the public challenge, the transparency of that change. It couldn't make up its mind on Saturday morning that it wanted to change the roads program and do it on Monday. So that's what we're about, but we're not about trying to lock in one, a single form of roads program. That would clearly be politically unsustainable. Last thing I just wanted to touch with a token nod to the agenda for this, for this slot is we have been criticised quite a lot that this is a kind of roads myopic um, approach, um, and there's some truth in that, though I wouldn't personally use the myopic word. Um, I, what I'm very conscious of is that there's a kind of disreputable history of attempts to plan holistically, to plan in an integrated way between modes. Uh, most of those have sadly come to grief. Multimodal studies that kind of got done partly on the roadside, but not elsewhere. Um, DAST, some of you might remember, is a transport planning device that actually resulted in nothing at all. I am very clear that um, we must not get bogged down in kind of paralysis by analysis, to use the cliché, that there is a key deliverable here of a road strategy that um, I am determined to deliver by the autumn. That will be a huge step forward in its own terms, but will actually create a planning vehicle that can then over time be brought into better communication with similar planning on the rail side. But to try and do everything now would be a recipe for doing, doing nothing. Okay, I will end with a, just a last uh, kind of positive point. Um, in March, the Highways Agency um, historically had been spending probably about one to two million a, a day uh, through much of 13, 14. In March 14, through a huge amount of hard work and a huge amount of just can do, we are going to make these schemes happen and we are going to you know, navigate our way through the planning process, through all the um, various checks and balances. The Highways Agency got that average up from the one to two million that had been more common in the recent past to four million a day in March. Uh, that is what's coming your way in terms of this sector. That's what you need to be preparing for. Thank you. John, many thanks, and uh, I think there's probably a lot of people in this room very willing and able to accept that challenge. Um, I'd now like, okay, we've got 10 minutes uh, or so for some questions, so really I'd like to open the floor. So, so a question for John, really. Alison mentioned the work that's been going on with the, um, the cities and so on around high-speed two and how you manage the, uh, the regeneration, but 
you know, it would be great if all the strategic road problems were fixed, but then, you know, you immediately run into a load of local road problems. So, so what's the, the integrated approach to working with the, whether the LEPs or the LAs to, um, to, to tackle that? I'll stand up to improve sound quality. Um, the, we're very conscious that there is a risk here, which we must at all costs avoid, which is to create a road silo kind of hardwired in, which finds it harder to work with um, other stakeholders. Now, I know in the past, Highways Agency has had issues. There have been complaints from some parties, the LEPs, um, Network Rail, Rail Track in their day have had problems in being properly linked in to other stakeholders, socioeconomic, other transport operators. So there's a real challenge there. Um, I think there is a really big untapped opportunity, untapped opportunity to plan together and to fund together. Um, one of the things that we announced last summer was uh, to make it possible for the Highways Agency to put money into a local transport network if that was also of benefit to the Highways Agency network to create the opportunity of planning together and get round problems I've encountered certainly in the past where um, people were dragging maps out and plans out and debating where the line precisely went at the junction over the motorway and whose bit of tarmac was which. Um, so we want to get beyond that, but there's also opportunities in operating together. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're all, you've all come across cases where the degree of interoperability between, say, a highways agency control centre and a local control centre, if there is one, is very, very limited. Uh, that's, I think, over time, it's not going to happen um, quickly, but over time, I think we can get more productive, uh, more serious working relationships. And I know it's certainly something Graeme Dalton has got in his mind in terms of building up the capacity of highways agency. I think, uh, forgive me, but perhaps the challenge is in the question. At the top here, we, we don't do integrated transport in this country, or we certainly haven't done. We have a legacy of not doing it. Um, and I think the challenge that really lays ahead, of, ahead for us is how do we change our complete approach to that? Because actually what we've heard is, uh, forgive me, but you know, for, for articulations of doing more of the same, to be honest, we. And the, the challenge with infrastructure is clearly once it's there, it's there. And to then sort of modify it in a way that makes it more integrated in the future is very difficult. I think one thing that is very certain is the future is extremely uncertain in terms of what we're going to want from our transportation. Uh, technology is going to drive change beyond any imagination. Driverless cars, demands, and, and, and what people want, and how we're going to want to do things, we can't really predict. How are we actually going to get our mind around how we actually produce for the future? transport solutions that are truly capable of being integrated and, and will also start to develop some sort of flexibility so we can in some way adapt to the future. Because I don't see anything at the moment that's terribly visioned in what we're doing. We're, we're widening roads to get more cars down them in the same places. Uh, we've got a high-speed rail that's going to relieve some capacity, but not a lot. It's a bit more integrated in the north and the south. It doesn't connect to, it doesn't give you a connection to, um, to the mainland. In fact, that's one of the things we've shied away from. Our airports are where they are, and basically they're really only serviced by roads. I mean, I know we've got some train net capacity to them, but Stuart Wingate was waxing lyrical about train routes into Gatwick. I went and followed up some of the ones he told me I could do, and it's going to take about three hours to get there. And it's a, it's a real challenge for the future, I think, about how we genuinely open our minds up to integrated transport that's going to have proper flexibility for travel uh, demands that we simply cannot predict. I don't know who would like to pick that one up. Perhaps, perhaps I could, could I come to you first, John? Because you did actually say... They come to me last. <laughs> <laughs> but you did actually say um, uh, in your presentation that we'd sort of given integrated transport a go, haven't we? we, we we'd gone for the multimodal studies, we'd gone for DASTs and so on, and actually it was all very difficult. So um, sort of now we're, we are where we are. So I just wonder if you could sort of cover it from where you are, and then perhaps I'll ask uh, the other contributors to see what they feel. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a cynic on all of this because it, it is, of course, very persuasive, what you said. Um, I, at one level, I can hardly disagree. I, I think it's when we actually try to do something about it, it becomes rather sad. Um, and what I, I, I certainly do not believe integration is central government publishing 100-page long white papers with 30 photographs 
um, seven um, snazzy little maps um, and lots of pledges. That's not integration. Um, I think integration, real integration, will often happen at the real working tactical level of how to knit different systems together. And the fact that you can walk from the Victoria Line to the Bakerloo Line um, um, in about 30 feet, whereas the Jubilee Line, um, it usually involves um, a couple of hundred yards of um, wandering through tunnels, is an illustration of one scheme, the Victoria Line, that took time to make it work, and the Jubilee Line, which couldn't afford to. Um, and it's at that level, I think, it really happens. And of course, it's at that level that it engages everyone in this room. That's a short commentary from... If I, can, if I can just add a couple of comments there, I think that um, there is something that, about the UK's attitude to planning. Um, I, I know what's happening in, in Denmark quite well. Uh, in Denmark, they build a bridge to Sweden. That's a pretty big bridge and tunnel, by the way, and it's a pretty big initiative. But associated with that, they build a metro because they know that the uh, city of Copenhagen will develop. They build a fabulous metro, which actually also works well with cycling. So. They're quite happy with the fact that they've got this vision about the way in which these aspects will link together. And I think they're confident there that a certain level of state or regional planning um, will have a good impact, and the people are with them on that. I think that we're a little bit more self-effacing in the UK. We're a little bit more restless about um, uh, our ability to actually plan people's journeys and work this through. And I don't want to uh, obviously imply any sort of micromanagement. We need to let that kind of come from... Um, from the regions and, and come from cities and come from people but I think that we need to be confident about the fact that we can plan um, good interconnections between different <coughs> modes of transport and I think we should see that as our obligation as engineers. Mm -hmm. I would agree with a lot of what both Andrew and John were saying. I mean, from, from an airport's perspective, um, well, actually the, overall I mean, from Eversphere we're a very private sector um, um, industry and uh, I was reading John Arm's report last night, and uh, he was basically saying that I think 60% of economic infrastructure is private in the UK, compared to the nearest rival, which is Australia, which is 30%. So it's going to be complex. There's so many actors in our space to get to coordinate and integrate it. And I, I never say we should have an integrated transport system. We should have a more integrated transport system, or we'll never necessarily get there. But there is an element of common sense that sometimes I find uh, incredible, and, and it's great having Alison Rose sit next to me. I do find it incredible that we're talking about HS2 without knowing where our hub airport or hub capacity is going to be. So we know it's going to go to Manchester, we know it's going to Leeds, we know it's going to go through Birmingham. When it comes south, we might have more hub capacity at Heathrow or Gatwick or Thames Estuary, and yet that won't be leaking to HS2, which to me, again, lacks common sense for the sake of a year or two. Um, just looking at airport schemes around the country, you know, it's obvious that Heathrow needs to be connected west and south. It's obvious that Stanston needs upgrades and, and, and more frequent trains. It's obviously Gap that needs more dedicated. These are things, it's to do with common sense a lot of the time. And if we can all push in the same direction, I, I, I conclude, concluded my remark, if government gets behind us, we all benefit. It's got to be government-led. Government's got to push these projects for all, for all our sakes. And, and the, the, the key issue is how it affects local communities. And we have to have a better way of speeding that up. But the country needs it if we're going to power ahead in the, in the years to come. Okay, thank you, Alison. I think the last word to you. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I'm, I'm with John on this. I mean, I don't think integration is about some sort of massive national plan that connects absolutely everything to everything. Um, it's actually about sort of practical. You've actually got to focus on. You know, you've got to start somewhere and actually sort of focus on some practical examples. I mean, I, I don't think I actually accept that. Uh, you know, that we're not doing anything different. We're certainly trying um, with, with high speed. I think it does come down to. Um, working very closely and getting the local plans properly integrated, which is what we're trying to do. We're at the beginning of the process, but we are trying to make sure that working with um, partners at a local level, our plans for our high speed two stations are integrated with local plans. So, if I give an example of, of um, and it's not all down to us to do it, it's actually working with other partners. So, for example, Old Oak Common, where we have a real opportunity to have an integrated transport hub. We were working very closely with, um, with Transport for London and the GLA and, and the Mayor and the local authorities there to, to try to meet their ambitions um, for having a wider integrated hub. Now, there's a real opportunity there. I think you know, setting all that sort of, infra sort of you know, um, procedural and, and infrastructure in place to actually make, get the parties to work together, but there is an opportunity there, and, and you know, we, we are trying to exploit that. So I think we have the opportunity. I don't think... Um, yeah, 
as I say, I'd accept your criticism that we're not trying to do anything different, but it is actually a, a, difficult, you know, a difficult thing to do to build all these different things together and get all the funding in place as well, because that's often where we sort of stumble, um, making sure we've got all the funding mechanisms in place as well to support the local transport that supports the, the national infrastructure. Right. Okay, and with that, I think I will draw it to a close. Um, uh, and I think we've had a really excellent session to start the, uh, start the day off. I've just jotted down some of the themes that are coming through. We've got diversity, inclusion, uh, employment, training, regional economic benefit, taxation, competitiveness, sustainability. There's some parliamentary legislation. I mean, the, the, the agenda is very, very broad all around uh, this theme of, uh, of transport. And I think we've brought out a lot of those issues uh, extremely well. So can I just ask you all to thank, once again, all of the speakers. Thank you.